Well, earlier in the year, the Prime Minister said improving mental health provision was a personal priority. Yet many mental health services across the country are facing cuts. I went to Liverpool to make a group of young people worried about their future after funding for a service they rely on was cut almost in half. For a long time, our mental health was considered by many something best kept to ourselves. Problems lurked just beneath the surface, often only emerging when the situation became critical. We've come a long way since then, to the point that the government promised an end to the chronic underfunding of the past and that there would be parity in the way in which the NHS deals with mental and physical well-being. And yet, recent research shows that many clinical commissioning groups, CCGs, plan to reduce the proportion of their budget spent on mental health, putting projects like the Young People's Advisory Service in Liverpool at real risk. I was very anxious at the time when I first accessed and quite depressed as well. And I've been to the doctors consistently and they just put it down to hormones. You're growing up, you know, it's hormones, it's normal, this is what happens. And I just remember sat there thinking, this, this isn't normal, you know, I don't know anyone else who feels the way that I do. I went through school, like, being different to everyone else. I was jumping on tables, jumping under the tables, just not cooperating with the teachers at all. And um, they just thought, naughty kid, just doesn't want to learn. My story started when I was in foster care, uh, just after I ended, left foster care, when I moved here to the university. Um, I was going through a bit of depression and social. I didn't have the situations that, that I could talk to people quite quickly, as normal people would. I didn't have the, that friendship group to talk to, so I was left by myself alone most of the time. I'm just like this. Provision of services for young people is particularly sensitive, given that the overwhelming majority of mental health problems in adulthood first present before your mid-twenties. really didn't enjoy school because social anxiety, because I have struggled with Asperger's and a mild form of ADHD. So um, I was also struggling with my sexuality as well. I've been able to be more confident, more free about myself and to be a, ha a normal, happy person instead of being a sad person that was on medication all the time. I wouldn't have been able to do this four years ago. I really wouldn't. How important then a part of your life is wiper? It's very much, you know, very significant. A very big significant part of my life, very important because I do not think I would be the person I am today without them. But like many other services around the country, Ypass has lost a huge amount of their funding through no fault of their own. Instead, because of decisions made by their local clinical commissioning group. It's around 43% the funding reduction. £750,000. That's 26 staff members. That's around 15 therapists and 11 information advice and guidance workers which offer lower level support. Catastrophic, disastrous. What children and young people need is they need somebody, a service, to support them with those real intense feelings that they're experiencing. The need to cut themselves just to stay alive, not to cut themselves to die, to cut themselves to stay alive and to help and for an organisation to help them make sense of why they're needing to do that in order to cope. We do that on a daily basis. All this while the government maintains that funding is substantially increasing. In real terms, yes, the money has gone up, but the demand has outstripped that supply and the cost of treatment goes up about 3 or 4% a year as well. So politicians like to talk about in real terms. In real terms, it's a cut. And that's where you really into the idea of which will do the least harm. Not the most benefit anymore, that's a very different conversation. And that led to some governing body meetings at Liverpool CCG that was some of the most difficult meetings of my life. Because we had doctors and nurses, because that's what CCGs are run by, with our management colleagues round the table, putting lines through various bits of contracts that we knew were going to have absolute impact on the front line to the people of this city. But we had to weigh that up against the least harm. 757,000, it's 47%. Little wonder that the local MP is calling for mental health spending to be ring-fenced, if, that is, a space can be found in the upcoming budget. 
We know that the overwhelming majority of adults with a diagnosable mental health condition will have developed it as a young person. It doesn't make any sense that young people can't access those services early on to help them and to ensure that they are well into adulthood. We're storing up so many more problems for the future if we don't really focus on this and get it right. And it's clear from all the evidence that we're not getting it right. I'm hearing the stories firsthand from parents whose children are attempting to take their lives. I've got an example of one I've received just in the last few hours. There are definitely children attempting to take their lives. We know the levels of self-harm amongst young people are increasing and there's a massive correlation between self-harm and people that ultimately go on to take their lives. This is a very serious matter. This is a life or death matter. You know, that, that any young person that takes their life is a tragedy. Let's stop those tragedies and let's ensure that it doesn't happen. Clearly, it is difficult, to say the least, to entirely justify the government's claim that they're putting uh, mental health care provision on an equal footing with that for our physical well-being, particularly in a part of the country like this, where demands on the NHS in general are increasing far faster than the funding. And that's the thing about mental health care. Early intervention is key to its efficacy and, indeed, can end up saving the NHS money. Properly funded, trained support is required if the government's promises on mental health are to amount to more than words. For lives are at stake here, and much more is needed than a mere shoulder to cry on. And I'm joined now by Labour's Shadow Health Secretary, John Ashworth. Mr Ashworth, good morning. Good morning. Um, I should say at this point, the Department of Health have, have given us a, a, a line on this. We're investing more in mental health than ever before, spending at a record £11.6 billion this year. The benefits of record funding can already be seen in areas such as mental health support in A&E, 24-7 crisis services and support for pregnant women and new mothers. Look, the situation in Liverpool mm. is but a snapshot and it's not reflected across the board. Mm. But the idea that there would be parity of esteem, an aspiration of parity of esteem between physical and, and, and mental well-being, we're some distance from that, aren't we? Um, considerable distance, as we've just seen in that very moving uh, package. The problem is that the government over the first five years of their uh, time in office actually reduced the proportion going on mental health spend. It's why, for example, we've got 4,000 less beds, we've got something like 5,500 less nurses working in mental health. And although the government now says they're increasing the mental health budgets, they're not doing what we call ring-fencing it. They're not saying to local health boards, the CCG, in the t as we call them these days, we're not saying to them, you have to spend this money on mental health. So because of the wider pressures on the NHS, many of these local health areas, the CCGs, are raiding those budgets and transferring the money into the wider running of the NHS because of the overall underfunding of the National Health Service. So we're saying, ring fence that money you know actually put a put a, you know a ring fence around the mental health budget so rather than being cut at a local level as we've just seen in liverpool it actually goes to those who need it still i, I mean I, I can't remember a time when the party of opposition didn't say that the nhs was in was in crisis in some form or another mm. so what what makes the situation affecting the nhs at the moment in your mind as acute as it's ever been oh i think we're in a very serious situation i mean i mean new figures that we've uh, seen in the last few days sh show that the waiting times are now at uh, four million and could hit five million according to simon stevens the nhs boss if they don't get uh, more money and the number of people who are uh, designated as a trolley weight that's people who can't even get a bed in an a and e in the last year it's been 565 thousand under a Labour government it was 60,000 that's the scale of a difference just today I've released new figures which show nearly 27,000 people are not getting an urgent referral for cancer treatment within two months and of course we all saw the very serious uh, winter last year in the NHS with ambulances backed up people in corridors it's incredibly serious and if I may say so I've seen Philip Hammond doing interviews today he's been kind of dismissive of the calls for more money for the NHS saying well you know it's going to be Armageddon this is happening now today in the NHS and if he doesn't realize that he's completely out of touch but isn't part of the problem that we never seem to be able to have an adult discussion about the funding of the health service or whether it should be providing free treatment in, in every instance without someone somewhere suggesting that you're proposing uh, you're proposing privatizing the entire thing I mean a number of your colleagues mm. have made the point that perhaps now is the point at which we should move the health service and uh, and, uh, you know, and attendant services out of the world of party politics and have some you know, non-partisan approach to it all. What do you make of that? Well, I'm always happy to talk to anyone about the future of NHS financing. I mean, we in the Labour Party are calling on the Chancellor to put aside an extra £6 billion 
in this budget coming up, but over the next 5, 10, 15 years, I'm up for a discussion in this country about long-term funding of the NHS. All the think tanks suggest that we need something like an extra 20 billion by 2022, 2023, and so on. So well, I'm, no, no, none of that, none of that removes the fact that you know, you know, the health service is a political football that gets punted from one side of the chamber to the other. Well, I wouldn't say it's a political football, but politicians have to make choices about funding. And this is a government which, over seven years, has chosen to underfund the NHS, has chosen to cut the public health budgets, which is the, uh, the budgets which deliver things like uh, uh, sexual health services support and uh, uh, smoking cessation support and health visitors and things like that in the communities. All those budgets have been cut. And, of course, social care budgets uh, have been cut by billions, which is putting huge pressure on the NHS because there's so many elderly and vulnerable people going without the care package. So I don't want to use it as a political football, but I think it's right and proper that we highlight decisions that the government have made, which is having a consequence for patient care today. Uh, now that we have you in the studio, and we've been looking forward to this, um, you know, I've, I've lost count over the, the, the weeks that I've been doing the show, the number of times that you or your colleagues have said that, that, that Labour is a government in waiting. I mean, what does that mean, given that technically every opposition is a government in waiting, and some of them wait quite a long time? Well, <laughs> I think it actually means that we are preparing uh, to take over when this government falls. I mean, this government is looking increasingly hapless. And we've now got David Davis in the newspapers saying he may well walk out. I mean, Philip Hammond today has also said that there's no unemployed people in this country. I mean, how out of touch is this Chancellor? I mean, Theresa May looks completely uh, bewildered all the time. I mean, this government could collapse at any moment. And we're making the point that we have got a programme for government and we're ready to step in. Given the, your, your contention that this government could, could collapse at any moment, it is then f therefore fair for us to ask for you know, specific answers yes, to course. specific questions. How much should the UK be giving the European Union uh, as its bill for leaving the Well, that's part of the negotiations, isn't it? I mean, but you've got to have an idea. Well, you know, that's that's part. That's why you go into a negotiation. Twenty billion, but thirty you, you, billion, you go into forty a billion. We need to go into a negotiation, don't we? But clearly, we want to have the best access to the single market and the customs union to safeguard British jobs and prosperity, and the NHS because the NHS is impacted by our relationship with the European Union. But these are matters for negotiation. In terms of the project of, of nationalisation, which mm -hmm. of course is, is, is central uh, to Labour's claim to being a, a party, a government in waiting, rail, electricity, water uh, and Royal Mail, how much would it cost? How well, much would it, I mean, be, I mean, would it be funded? I mean, John MacDonald has said that these are matters that he will bring forward, uh, he will bring forward these uh, uh, calculations in due course. But what I can tell you, for, in the NHS, the privatisation in the N NHS means that we're now spending £8 billion on the private sector. Mm -hmm. It is destabilising the NHS. I'll give you a quick example. In Sussex, a contract for patient transport was given to a private company who didn't even own any vehicles, who subcontracted out to 20 other companies, and, the, and who, two of whom went bust, and the workers had to go without wages. Look, so we are saying on things like that, they need to be brought in-house. Yeah, OK, on, but on that point, we heard from the Shadow, the shadow Chancellor this morning, his idea is that you would swap shares in these kind of, you know, private, you know, these, uh, these entities uh, for government bonds. It is, in essence, borrowing by another name. It would almost certainly be in excess of, of £100 billion. You know, but, but let's contrast that with your offer on, you know, public sector pay. I mean, what are you proposing in terms of a rise uh, for NHS staff specifically? Well, we've said we want a real terms rise, but that would be decided through collective bargaining, through the pay review bodies, for a proper process. What we don't think is fair is this pay freeze which has been in place for seven years. Now, the Chancellor and Jeremy Hunt are saying they, that we're going to get rid of this pay freeze, but they will pay for it by productivity gains. Mm -hmm. No, we don't want productivity gains. We want a proper, fully funded pay rise for NHS staff. My, productivity my, my point gains. Is this, you're, willing, you're willing to spend in excess of £100 billion on you know, money we don't have, on stuff that we do not need but you're not willing to borrow to give a proper pay rise to nurses? No, because we can fund a pay rise through different decisions on taxation. Right. We can make dis different decisions on corporation tax, on, uh, on uh, income taxes for the very wealthiest in society, and we've been very upfront about that. The top 5% will pay more tax in this country, but that will allow us to fund public services like schools, like hospitals, and indeed give NHS staff a fair pay rise. Uh, with the announcement on, on housing, it does appear that the government is parking its tanks very firmly on your lawn, doesn't it? Well, we'll see. I mean, we've, been, we've had umpteen announcements from the government, from this Chancellor and the previous Chancellor, on housing. And you know what? The houses never seem to get built. So we'll have to look at the detail. But the, the record so far doesn't leave us with much confidence. But certainly the one thing the Chancellor doesn't want to do is borrow any more money. 
for Well, we'll have obvious to wait and reasons. see. I mean, we've had Sajid Javid going around saying that he should borrow more money to build houses. So we're going to see who's uh, going to be successful in the budget. Will it be the Chancellor or will it be Sajid Javid? I suspect that the number of houses we need in this country won't actually get built because we have loads of big announcements, we have loads of targets from this Tory government, mm. and yet they never actually follow through. Uh, whilst we have you, um, what do you make of the um, uh, former Scottish Labour leader, Kezia Dugdale's decision? to go into the jungle on I'm a Celebrity. I mean, should she be suspended from the party? Well, I think Jeremy has said um, she shouldn't be suspended. Oh, these are yeah, Richard Leonard said something slightly well, different. Well, these are matters for the, the Scottish party. I mean, look, you know, I, I, quite, I like Kezia. I, I've, I got on with her well when I... I don't know her particularly well, but when I did have meet her, I got on very well with her. But I think there are better ways to further the cause of the Labour Party than eating kangaroos what's it in the jungle. <laughs> Conversation I never thought I'd be having on a Sunday morning before I've had my polish. But, I mean, would you ever do it? Would you ever appear on, on reality no. TV? I don't know. I'm, I'd, I'd perhaps see an appearance on Love Island, maybe? <laughs> Celebrity <laughs> Love Island? You've got to be kidding, haven't you? No, not me, no. No, but, but, well, but there, is a, there is a real point here, isn't it? That politicians do sometimes seem a little bit distant from the people that they're supposed to represent. There's nothing wrong with this. It's a bit of fun, isn't it? Yeah, but I think the, I think the difference is Ed Balls, for example, w when he went on Strictly and became a huge superstar. Everyone loved him, but that was after he was a politician. Mm. I think it's difficult when you've got a full-time job as a politician, when you're a parliamentarian. But, look, it's a matter for the Scottish Party, and, uh, uh, you know, we'll, and they'll, they'll come to a decision, I'm sure. We, we'll wait and see. John Ashworth, many thanks for being with us. And if you've got any questions about the show at all, I'll be live on the Facebook page shortly. Just search for Sunday with Neil Patterson. That's your lot for this week. But I will be back next Sunday. We'll see you then. Searching for light and can't seem to find